Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Anna, and I'm going to be talking a bit about synchronous I.O. and Node.js. Uh, before we get started on this, um, who am I? So I'm Anna, pronouns are she, her. I was previously on the Node.js technical steering committee, so I, I was getting paid full time to work on Node.js core. Um, so in September, I joined the MongoDB uh, team, uh, the DevTools team. Um, and my handle, if you have any questions or want to reach out in some other way, uh, is addalex in, uh, on Twitter and GitHub, at least. And uh, I'm also the mom of these two little cuties. Um, but yeah, so let's let's try to remember, like, the subtitle of this talk is don't try this at home. And like, why don't we want to do synchronous IO and Node.js? I'm pretty sure you've heard that you shouldn't, but why? So here, side by side, on the left-hand side, you have the classical synchronous way of loading, of doing IO, of loading a file from disk. On the right-hand side, you have an asynchronous way. And in this case, you could also say it's more modern because it uses async await promises. Um, in the end, these two give the same result. And um, well, what, why don't we want the left hand side? Why don't we want people to do what's on the left? Uh, the reason is performance. And before I get into details on that, so like if you benchmark a single fs.read file sim call against a single fs.read file call, so sim versus async, um, I tried to do that for this talk. What I would have expected to happen is that the synchronous version is slightly faster than the async version if you just do a single call because the synchronous version only has to, it only has to go and read the file and return the results. And the async version is, it actually has to schedule doing that and then waiting for the result to come back. So I would have expected the async version to be a bit faster, uh, the, the synchronous version. Um, first of all, in the beginning that was true, but that was like, it was so much uh, faster that I'd actually discovered a bug in the fs.promises.refile implementation that affected performance. And after fixing that, I don't know, the async version is faster for some reason. I, if you want, you feel free to dig into this and tell me what's going on. Um, but yeah, generally, that is what I would have expected. But anyway, so the big advantage of just doing async IO is that multiple things can happen at the same time. And that's the general idea of Node.js. You can do something, do something else, and have and wait for these two things to happen before you go on. And other things can happen also while those operations are ongoing. Um, with synchronous, everything happens after one another. And while your process does this file loading, nothing else can happen. No JavaScript, no other IO, nothing. But yeah, so. There are exceptions to when it is okay to do this. You should not, but some cases. So loading code require, and as far as I know, also ESM import, um, they do synchronous file system IO. Uh, for ESM, that's not something that's technically necessary, and I hope we can get away from that at some point. Um, and, but yeah, because ESM loading is asynchronous anyway, and you wouldn't necessarily notice if the file system IO was happening asynchronously. Second case, you'd absolutely know that what you're doing is the right thing to do. Um, for example, you're writing a CLI application where you, where there's a very limited set of things going on at a time, and you know that nothing else is happening at the same time. I would still encourage you to write asynchronous code simply because that you should follow that best practice, even if it's not strictly necessary. And the third case is you need synchronous code for some reason. And um, that might be because some API or some user facing interface exposes your code as synchronous and you have no other choice. And I'm gonna be talking a bit about that last case here because so what do I actually do at my job these days? <laughs> Um, so if you've ever worked at MongoDB, this might, or not eh, with MongoDB, <laughs> this might seem a little familiar. There's this Mongo CLI utility where you can pass something that looks like a URL and um, say, hey, connect to this server, connect to this database, and then you can get a shell um, 
where you can run commands such as in this case, db.test.find. It doesn't really matter for this talk that this is MongoDB. It, this might as well be the MySQL CLI and the command could be select asterisk from test. Uh, basically the same thing. Uh, so the, the project that I'm currently working most on is actually rewriting this uh, something called Mongo's H or Mongosh, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Uh, it pretty much does the same thing. You pass it as some URL like thing and you can get a shell and you can run the same kind of command there. Uh, why are we doing this? So Mongo, the old or old shell is basically what I've gotten used to calling it. Um, that is a spider monkey based C++ application. So it, it is a C++ application that uses the JavaScript engine from Firefox to run JavaScript um, in, from the shell. Um, and we're, so what we are writing this Mongosh thing, this, <laughs> I, um, sorry about that. Um, the, it's a Node.js application. So, and we're doing this too. So first of all, JavaScript applications are a bit nicer to maintain. It's just, it's a more high level language than C++ as much as I like C++. Um, Node.js already has a great REPL implementation that we can build on top of, but we don't have to write all of this again. And we can even embed this in electron apps and maybe web pages at some point. We're actually doing that first thing. So there's this GUI for uh, MongoDB, which is called Compass, which is also maintained by our team. And we embed this in an Electron app as a React component, basically, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so this old show, the way it worked is like you type some command like db.test.find and it, it synchronously does IO because there is no event loop, no nothing, no Node.js involved. Uh, there's no reason to do anything asynchronous, but we are building on top of the Node.js driver. The Node.js driver does network IO. You don't have um, synchronous network IO in Node. It's just not there. And that that is tricky because like people shouldn't have to know about async await in order to be able to use our shell. People have written scripts for the old shell that ideally why we want to keep working as much as possible. And so like the question becomes, how do we make this method do something synchronously? And so that is kind of what inspired me to give this talk. Um, what, what are the different approaches that we could take here? So first of all, there's the easy way of doing synchronous IO and Node, which is synchronous methods. They are just there, they are in the API. You have fs.refile sync, which just does a synchronous file operation. Uh, doesn't really solve our use case here, obviously, uh, because it doesn't cover network I.O. And that is what we're mostly concerned about here. So it, that is kind of a non-starter for us. And also, if you ask me, and this is just my personal opinion, the fact that this is even possible that these read files sync and, and, and similar operations are there, there's no good reason why, why file system I.O. in libuv in the underlying uh, library that, that supports Node um, is implemented the way it is. There's no good reason why it shouldn't work just like accessing network or SCDIO streams or anything else. Um, I think that's a design flaw and we shouldn't be able to have these things in the first place. Obviously they're not going away because millions of people are using them, uh, but yeah. So then, and <laughs> um, this is uh, this is something that if you think about doing synchronous IO and Node, probably not gonna be thinking about in the first, like it's not gonna pop it, uh, into your head at first. Uh, what you can do is you can write C code or Rust or C++ and compile it to Wasm. Uh, so basically anything that C Lang supports uh, would work here as, um, and then you can use WASI, which is the WebAssembly system interface, which Node.js supports, um, and use that to run that code. And what that looks like in practice, so on the left-hand side, there's a C file. It doesn't really matter what it does, but there's a lot of calls that start with F, which means file IO. Um, on the right-hand side, 
you have the corresponding JavaScript. You can create these WASI objects. Um, in Node.js, they are experimental and you need to pass a flag in order to get them to work, but they are there and they are supported. And using these steps, you can actually run this code on the left and it will work completely synchronously. I think this is a very cool thing to have, but it's also still very experimental and it's currently not very useful for writing JavaScript apps because if you wanted to use this from JavaScript, you would be in a situation where you, well, you would have to act like a WebAssembly application, which means serializing everything that you want to pass through a call into an array buffer and then reading it back afterwards. And it's just not ergonomic at all. Okay, so this is also not something that we want to do. But as far as I know, this would support web at uh, uh, network IO. Um, then there's the, <laughs> the boring brute force, very straightforward node way, which is like you, um, you write a C or C++ or Rust add-on, and um, it doesn't re really require more than this. This would also be in a working example, except for like there's boilerplate missing, obviously. Um, but you could do this. You could write a native add-on that you load from, from, from Node.js and that performs the IO for you. Um, this is also something that like, you know, we don't want to re-implement the whole Node.js networking stack um, just so that we can have synchronous IO in this. Um, that would be far too much work. Uh, it's also like probably not, it's not something that LibUV supports. So we would have to come up with some clever ways of doing it in other ways. It would require rewriting so much code. We're not doing that. So, and now let's get to like the more, uh, the, the ways that I am more excited about personally. <laughs> so uh, this is my favorite probably because it's it's kind of production ready at this point and we might actually be able to use it in the future um so what do we do uh we mix workers with atomics and the reason this is the nuclear sign and not the atom emoji is that everybody would have just thought react um <laughs> so how does this work Let, let's look at the at an example Again, this is pretty much runnable code. The left-hand side, the main thread side is missing some imports, but it's basically working. What the main thread does, which when it starts up is it creates a message channel and a shared array buffer. Um, and it needs a shared array buffer. We'll get to that in a second. And it starts a worker to which it passes one side of the, of the communication channel and that shared array buffer and then it waits on that shared array buffer using atomics.wait. And in the worker thread, what then happens when it started up? Well, it, it, gets the, it gets the data that it was sent from the main thread and it runs an async function. And that is actually just doing things that are super familiar for you already. Um, you've probably, most of you have seen node fetch at some point. It's a very nice API for loading. Um, HTTP re uh, request, and it's also very good for these examples because it's very straightforward to 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 get uh, to do I/O with it. Uh, it's like three lines of code here. So what happens is we load it, we use a way to fetch it, a way to wait for the whole response body to get back to us. This is obviously missing error handling, but you know, so <laughs> you don't really do that. Uh, on, on slides like these where there's limited space. And then what we do after we got that response, we post it back to the main thread and then we use atomics.store, atomics.notify. And because it's a shared array of so it's shared memory between the main thread and the worker thread. This actually wakes up that wait call that happened in the main thread, which was blocking. So nothing else progress in the main thread it was still waiting at that line for somebody to call atomic sub notify on another thread. And then on the main thread, we, we look at the, um, we look at what we got. We use this receive message from party API, which is Node.js specific. You could emulate it with on the, on the web, but it's like 
it's, it's a bit more convenient this way. And then we print out the response. And this general idea, I think this is pretty cool. It just allows you to do things synchronously if you really need to. And it has some advantages. Um, so again, this is like how it looks schematically. The main thread is blocked and does not progress. It does not return to its own event loop. It just spawns a worker thread, lets that event loop run on a different thread, and then waits for that response to come back before it progresses in any way. And so big advantages in Node.js, you can use the full Node.js API and NPM packages in the worker. Uh, the small downsides are so atomics.wait is not allowed on main threads in browsers, because if it were, that would, well, atomics.wait is a blocking call that does not allow anything to progress on the main thread. So it would block rendering, for example, indefinitely, uh, which is not something that should be allowed by a web page. <laughs> um, and it, it still doesn't fully give us what we need because it doesn't allow manipulating ob objects inside the worker. So if you think about this fetch example, if we had one or two, for example, add an event listener to the response object that we saw there, um, we could not have done that easily because we there is no way to access these objects inside the worker. So there would have to be some kind of RPC protocol that takes care of that. And yeah, um, generally not very ergonomic in that way, but it's still very cool, very production ready. There was nothing experimental in what I showed. Um, and, and you could use this, um, for example, inside a worker thread. Um, so Atomic Subway does work inside of worker threads inside the browser. So you could kind of do things like this. Um, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so none of these things really worked. And so what I did was like, I went to my evil scientist lab. I thought, so I know Node.js very well. I'm very familiar with its internals. I should be able to come up with a solution for this, right? And so, uh, yeah, remember when I made workers, which you're like, yeah. I didn't make them all by myself. Obviously, other people were involved. But like this statement, it doesn't feel entirely inaccurate. Um, and well, I, yeah. Anyway, so back then, I obviously gave talks about that too. And so one of the slides from back then is like, the idea behind that is to embed your Node.js into itself, to start a new Node.js instance, just like the main thread, except on a different operating system thread. Um, and it turns out, like, if you think about it a bit more, um, you don't even need a separate thread for this. Um, you can do it on the same thread. This is something that, like, I have thought about this in the past for various reasons. I, um, for example, testing systems like TAP or uh, MoCal might want to run um, pieces of code inside, like, somewhat isolated environments. Um, I know I had conversations about that, where I thought about like what could we do about the um, about XX sync and and similar functions in Node.js in the um, in in child processes. Uh, so the 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 way that these are implemented in Node is like they have like entirely separate implementations from the async methods. There's no good reason for that, and. I think with this, we could even get down complexity inside of Node.js quite a bit if it ever ended up in Node.js. So the idea is instead of like having separate threads where the main thread event loop still runs, it gives us its callback. And inside the inside a callback or during startup code, we start a new event loop, a new Node.js instance with its own event loop on the same thread. And until we're done with that, nothing else on the main thread progresses. And so I came up, I, <laughs> it's a pandemic. I was a bit bored during the holidays. So this is a project that I came up with. And the idea is like, this is all you need to actually achieve what we want. Um, so you create a synchronous worker. That's what I call it because it's kind of like a worker and that it starts a new Node.js instance, but it's also like no uh, multi-threading involved. So it's synchronous. So, you can create a require function inside that node fetch, uh, inside that, that worker that loads node fetch. And then you have something, you have a fetch function that only runs inside 
the worker. Um, and then you can do cool things like worker that run loop until promise resolve and pass it a promise in that was created inside this worker. And you can do that twice to get the full text and you can print that out. And this is also, again, a runnable example. Um, there is a couple downsides. So it's like, this is not just only, it's currently implemented as a native add-on, so browsers don't support this. And I think if they ever wanted to support that, it would be years until they actually got to it. Uh, it's also Node.js 15.5 and above only because there were some bug fixes that we needed to get into Node.js in the first place. You should consider very experimental. Like feel free and feel encouraged to try some things out with it, but it's probably really easy to make the process crash using it. Uh, but you do get the full Node.js API, like in workers, you get full event loop control and you can access the JavaScript objects just like any other JavaScript object. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, if you were wondering, so like none of these things actually work for Mongo's edge uh, because they all had drawbacks, as you saw. What we actually currently do is if we get input like this, where somebody tries to use the result of an asynchronous call synchronously, what we do is we use Babel to transpile it to async code and that, that, that works well enough for us. Uh, also has some drawbacks, like it works on a best effort basis. Um, we're using a weight in places where we think it should be applied. And some language features are not supported, but overall this works well enough for us currently. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening. I'll upload the slides uh, soon. And if you have any questions or want to reach out at some point in the future, uh, you can ping me on Twitter. And so, yeah, thank you. And that's it.